All right, so chapter 22, I really like, uh, this is interesting stuff to me, but I hope that you guys can also find it fairly interesting. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into DNA and RNA, a little bit more about their functions, kind of how do we make DNA and RNA. There's also different types of RNA that we're going to go through, and those different types kind of work as like steps or building blocks to get to where we want to go. We're going to talk about how DNA is replicated. You've maybe in a high school class before heard of transcription and translation. If not, that's okay. We're going to go through it in detail. We're going to describe the genetic code. Um, what that just means is we're going to understand how we get a genetic code. We're going to talk about protein structure and function. Remember, proteins are macromolecules. Other macromolecules are lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, but proteins in specific, we're gonna talk about their structure and function. We're also gonna talk about the four levels of regulating gene expression. So essentially what happens with gene expression is you guys have a code of DNA inside your cell. It's very, very small. It's very small, but if you were to stretch it out, it'd be about six feet long. Is anybody about six feet tall in here? Yep, six feet tall. That's how long your DNA would be. It's so small that you can't really see it unless you use a very small mic or a very uh, powerful microscope. And within that gene code, it codes for your traits, your characteristics, your functions of your body. But there are different genes that turn on and off at different times, right? So we could give a couple of examples of that. When you're a, an infant, your body is growing and stretching and your, you know, your bones are growing and your all of this, a lot of development is going on. But later in life, right, that kind of slows down. A little bit after puberty, most people stop growing, not always, but that kind of is where we start to taper off a little bit, maybe plateau in the height department. We don't just keep growing until we're in our elderly years, right? So there's different genes that turn on and off turn on maybe when you're a young infant for growth and development, but then it maybe turns off as you, you know, get into post puberty years and things like that. So that's what kind of gene expression means. So there's some different ways that we regulate that. We're also going to talk about the human genome project. So the human genome project is essentially a project where we discovered the code for human DNA. And surprisingly, it wasn't that long ago that we found out about that. We're going to talk about different terms such as ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy. We're also going to talk about the term biotechnology, which if you kind of break it apart, so far we're just talking about biology and technology and how they kind of come together. We're going to also talk about some bacteria in plants and animals and how we can use that bacteria. Okay. You probably all heard of DNA. We've seen pictures of DNA in this class before. It looks like a spiral staircase. But what does our DNA do? You know that your DNA makes you unique to the person sitting next to you, but also unique to your parents, unique to your siblings. So DNA, it's replicated to be passed on to the next generation. Our DNA thinks that it's pretty cool. Like, our DNA think it's, it's the best DNA out there. And it just wants to be passed on to the next generation, okay? And what that means is, essentially we want those genes to be passed on to our offspring. So our genes and our DNA's main goal is just to keep moving forward. Our DNA stores information. That information is our traits, our behaviors. It codes for proteins. Proteins are the functions of our life, everything, whether it's your shoe size, or how big your feet are, what color is your hair, what color are your eyes, all came from a DNA code, essentially that had some different reactions that created you to be who you are. It undergoes mutations to, to provide genetic diversity. So an example I like to give is, everybody know what a polar bear is, right? You think of a polar bear in your head, it's a white kind of coated bear, right? Well, where did the polar bears come from? So do you guys know what Pangea is? Do you guys remember what Pangea is? It's essentially the theory of that all of the continents at one point were one big massive space. It's a theory, right? I wasn't there to see it myself, so I don't know. And at one point, 
uh, Alaska and like Russia, if you can kind of think about it, we're kind of touching each other. Okay, but over time, now we know that there's a little bit of an ocean in between. But there were some grizzlies that came over to Alaska. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, did they just turn into polar bears? No, that's not exactly what happened. So through mutations, they can provide genetic diversity. So I'm gonna draw a little picture because my, my acting skills are not that great. So here we've got, ooh, that looks like Russia. Yeah, kind of looks like Russia. All right, well, it's just gonna be the end of Russia, right? Russia goes on for over here a little bit more. And then we've got Alaska, right? There's Alaska. Does that look like Alaska? Kind of? You guys don't have to be nice to me, it's okay. All right, so at one point, through the theory of Pangea, these bears were able to kind of cross this. Okay, so here's a little bear. It's going over there. But as you know, these grizzly bears, they have like a brown colored coat. All right, in Alaska, even though I didn't draw it really well, it's actually a little bit more north of Russia. So there's a lot of, in, an Arct or in the Arctic and things like that, there's a lot of snow, ice, coal, okay? And if you can think about, you know, what that looks like, it's probably just a lot of white. But then you've got this brown bear who's probably more susceptible to being attacked, whether that's from, probably not humans at this time, but like other animals that would like to eat the bear. It can be seen more with the contrast of the white to the brown. Okay. But then through a mutation, so let's just say A, G, T, C, A. A, T, T, whatever, I made that up, okay? Let's say that this codes for brown fur, okay? And then on accident, the DNA messed up, not on purpose. The DNA messed up, and now this is gonna be G, G, G. I don't know, it happened. And it made a white polar bear. So now we got a white bear. I'll color this one in so we know that that one's a brown one, okay. So now we have this white bear. It was on accident. It wasn't like the bear recognized its environment and then changed its color, right? Because that would be pretty cool, right? I would just turn camouflage or something. That would be really cool. Nobody could see me. What happened was the DNA just messed up and it made a white bear. But through time, now this bear is able to survive more because it can blend in with its environment and not be hunted or preyed upon or anything like that. So now it's able to grow and develop and have some offspring. Now we're having two bears. These look more like dogs, like really round dogs. I'm so sorry. Okay, so now these polar bears grow and reproduce because they're able to survive. They're blending in with their environment. And the brown bears, they're be able to be seen more against the contrast of the white environment around them. So their population decreases and the polar bear population increases. And now we see a species diverging from what was a normally a grizzly bear. We've got another species that has a different genetic code that's actually growing and surviving in. Through that mutation, we have some genetic diversity. And this happens a lot. Maybe you've heard of Darwin's finches um, with evolution. That also happened where birds over time have adapted different styles of beaks. Not instantly, right? It's not like they said, hmm, I'm going to eat that seed. I'm going to make my beak optimal to eat that seed. That's not what it's saying. It's saying over generations and through those mutations that were beneficial, it able, they were able to eat a seed or a, a bug or something with a specific beak because it was beneficial. So that's a little bit about genetic diversity. The structure of DNA is a double helix. So it looks like a spiral staircase. Okay, um, I'm trying to think, has anybody ever driven through Traer, south of Cedar Falls, Traer? There's a wind up in Traer. Oh, there's a stair, spiral staircase in their downtown. But anyways, um, DNA is composed of repeating nucleotides made of a pento sugar, phosphate, and nitrogenous base. So what that means is we've got this spiral staircase that we've talked about before. This is a great image, you guys should uh, frame that. But this one, spiral staircase, looks kind of like that. 
okay? It's hard to imagine, but essentially think of it like that. You've got these base pairs. These are the, the nucleotides, okay? These little bars are called nucleotides. And it's made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. So that's like the railing of this staircase. It's made up of a sugar and a phosphate. Okay, we know that sugars are carbohydrates, right? They have a carbon ring. And a phosphate sometimes is indicated by a P with a circle. Okay, these are all the A's, the T's, the C's. Remember that it has matching on either side, okay? So that's a little bit about that sugar and phosphate. They make up the backbone, okay? The rungs of the ladder essentially, or like I think of it like the railing. Like if you were to walk up some stairs, you have a railing on either side, that's the sugar and the phosphate. And then the bases have a complementary pair, which is what I tried to show in that small picture right there. But on the right hand side, I wrote ATC. And on the left hand, I wrote TAG because A's and T's pair up and C's and G's pair up. So here's a much better descriptive picture <laughs> than what I drew. So here we have that double helix structure. Just imagine yourself walking up these stairs. You can see that it's kind of spinning on itself, a double, a double helix, okay? If I were to kind of flatten this out, like if you can picture it like a ribbon and I were just to pull the ribbon apart like this and kind of flatten it out, that's what we're looking at right here, okay? This blue part is this blue part. And these colors up the middle are these, uh, essentially the steps of the ladder. And you can see that it's made up of a sugar and a phosphate. The sugar is that kind of, in that hexagon shape, I guess it's a pentagon. One, two, three, four, five, pentagon, and then an S. This is the phosphate. It's just saying that it's made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. And then these are the base pairs of the nucleotides in the middle. A matches up with T, C matches up with G. T, A, G, C, T, A. And the pattern in which those letters happen are the genetic diversity that we see, okay? Um, a little bit about the one pair of bases there. So it's just saying you could separate these here and have a nucleotide with a sugar and a phosphate. So how is DNA replicated? Why would we want to replicate DNA? There's a couple of reasons. One, mitosis and meiosis, we talked about last week on the, or not last week, seems like last week, Monday, on the board over here. Remember, mitosis is the division and replication of all of our cells, your skin cells, your liver cells, your hair cells, all the things that you're so thankful that regenerate after a little while, okay? There's some types of cells that don't regenerate. Do you guys know what kind of cells those are? A really good hint. I'm not just thinking. Yeah, your brain cells, your nerve cells don't always regenerate. I say don't always, but there's a small instance where you can develop nerve endings. But essentially, that's why concussions are such a big deal, right? Because you don't want to, you know, damage your brain cells. We don't just kind of get new brain cells every two weeks. That'd be pretty cool. But um, essentially, our brain cells, some of our nerve cells, are not regenerating. But like your skin cells, like I said, we get new skin cells every two weeks. We don't shed like a snake. That'd be weird. It'd be kind of cool, but weird. And what happens is every single skin cell is on its own timeline. And so every time you get new skin cells, everything that you're looking at on your hand is all dead skin. Right, we talked about that, that keratinized skin. Okay, so why do we want to replicate DNA? Well, you replicate DNA every time you have to make a new skin cell, okay? Because there's DNA in your skin, in your cell, in the individual cell that makes up your skin, there's DNA in there. 
And in order to make a new skin cell, I need to replicate that DNA that's in there to make another one and make another one and make another one and grow and multiply. Okay. So the way that this happens is we have that double helix. It's all sp spun up on itself, the DNA. Those two strands kind of unwind and the H bonds are broken. So there's some hydrogen bonds in there that remember those are pretty weak. So those kind of, we kind of like pull apart that ribbon. Essentially we flatten it out. The complementary nucleotides are added to each strand by DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase, this word right here, it's an enzyme. And we know what enzymes are because they lower the activation energy. If you remember that, we had the graph where we had the two bell-shaped curves and one took less energy than the other. One used an enzyme and it had the same product at the end. So now we have essentially these pairs of nucleotides or the letters that are added to each strand because of this enzyme. And then a new double-stranded helix is made from those new strands. And I'm gonna show you a picture here, so don't get too hung up on my hand motions. The sequence of bases makes each individual unique. So yes, you may look different than your siblings, right? You've maybe seen my sister on campus. She looks like me, right? But she's not me. But we have very similar DNA because we were made from the same biological parents but we are different individuals because of the code of those letters. I, in one location, could have A-A-A-T-T-T, and my sister could have A-A-A-T-T-T-C. Who knows, right? I don't know. You could get a, a 23andMe uh, chromosome location genetic test if you wanted to figure all that out. I don't really have the time, but that's okay. So we're replicating this DNA. We want to replicate it so that we can grow and divide, make new cells, or maybe this is even a, a fetus or a zygote in a body that's reproducing and making, or not reproducing, but essentially multiplying and replicating their cells to grow and divide. Okay, so here we have that double helix. This is called the replication fork. It's just like a fork in the road, right? When you come across the fork in the road, you take it, right? Anybody heard that joke before? It's a good one, right? Okay. It's going to be a long day. We're not laughing at my jokes. <laughs> All right. So we're going to separate here, right? And then this little green ribbon is pairing up with these strands. And now we're going to make two new strands here. So essentially, we start with the regular. DNA, and then we have the new DNA because we opened it up at the replication fork and essentially added those complementary base pairs on the end, or essentially that green ribbon, and they made two new strands from the original strand. And then these two strands can each make their own strand, make their own two strands, and that's how you multiply everything. It just kind of grows and divides. We've talked about the difference between DNA and RNA. Some of the differences is that RNA is single-stranded. In that last picture of DNA, we had that double helix. There was two parts to it. RNA just has one strand, okay? It's composed of repeating nucleotides, just like DNA. It's also made up of a sugar phosphate backbone as the same railing, same sugar and phosphate, but the another difference is that it has a uracil instead of a thymine. So A's pair up with U's in RNA and C's pair up with G's like before. Okay, so DNA and RNA have some similarities and some differences. Another thing is that there's different types of RNA. And what's helpful for us is that their names are mRNA, rRNA, and tRNA. And each of those letters indicate what the name is. So an mRNA is a messenger RNA, and this carries genetic information from DNA to the ribosomes. It's like a messenger, right? It's like the UPS person, right? They're gonna carry the package to your front door, but they didn't create the package, and they're not receiving the package. They're just there to carry the message along, okay? You've got ribosomal RNA, 
which it joins with proteins to form ribosomes. Remember that picture of the cell with all those kind of rough, bumpy little yellow dots? That's ribosomes. And so a ribosomal DNA makes ribosomes. That makes sense, right? The name helps us out there. And then transfer RNA transfers the amino acids to a ribosome where they are added to form a protein, okay? You could think of it as like somebody getting transferred for their job, right? You're getting a promotion, you get to go to Chicago and you get to do your job there. We're gonna transfer you there. And once you're there, you're gonna help us make a product. So that's what a transfer RNA does. It transfers that amino acid to a ribosome where it's added to form that protein. Okay, so we've got messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. And what's lucky for us is that the names kind of tell them what they do which is helpful. Here's a picture of the structure of RNA. As you can see, it's just one single strand. The purple part is the same as the DNA. There's a sugar and a phosphate, right? There's a little S and a little P with a circle around it. But you see the bases are different. We've got G, U, A, and C. No T's in this one, no thymines, right? We just have a uracil. This is one nucleotide here at the bottom that's in that square. I guess it's technically a rectangle. All right, here's a kind of more descriptive picture of those different types of RNA, talking about mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, and how they do that. Another way I think about this is like making a bracelet, like with beads on a string, okay? The beads on this string need to go through here and come out the other side to end with some sort of product. Okay, so let's walk through this picture a little bit. You have this thing called a large ribosomal subunit and this called a small ribosomal subunit. And honestly, I think it looks like a hamburger bun. Do you guys kind of see it? You've got like the bottom part and the top part, unless you're vegetarian, it's a black bean burger, right? You can put that in there. Gluten-free, I'm sorry, now it's a gluten-free black bean burger, okay? And what comes in the middle here this is mRNA. This is the messenger, right? That's when you, you know, have to tell your friends some bad news and you're like, don't kill the messenger. I just had to tell you, right? It's not me. Okay? Messenger RNA. This is your tRNA. This is transferring these amino acids. These are amino acids to the ribosomal subunit so that we can make the protein. Okay? And we're looking for rRNA. Is it on here? No. That's fine. So it says an mRNA is a threaded between the ribosomal subunits, known to as a hamburger bun, and a polypeptide extends to the side. That's this. You can think of it like a bracelet. A ribosome has two binding sites. These are called binding sites. Um, where the codons bind to the anticodon, a tRNA, which is this, a polypeptide at the P site, which is this one, and then a new tRNA amino acid is approaching the A site. So it kind of works its way through this little hamburger bun thing. And then it makes a product. This is called an anticodon and it tells it when to stop. So essentially it's kind of making this beaded bracelet through this little machine and the beaded bracelet being proteins. I really like this question on quizzes and exams, right? You guys have seen it once before on, I think, your homework. What's the difference between RNA and DNA, right? Why do I like that question? Okay, well, it allows you to compare two things. That's pretty cool. It brings in a couple of different chapters, which is also nice. And this is some good stuff to know, okay? Um, the similarities, they all are made up of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are a macromolecule. All right, although the U's and the T's are different, those are all nucleotides. They're all made up of nucleic acids. When I say nucleotide and nucleic acid, they're the same thing. Um, so they are made of nucleotides. They are nucleic acids. Um, they have a sugar phosphate backbone, backbone. So they both have a sugar and a phosphate on their railing, essentially. And they are found in the nucleus. Um, you can also find DNA in the mitochondria. Fun fact. Um, differences. So DNA is double-stranded while RNA is single-stranded. We saw that from the pictures. 
Okay, the reason that RNA is single-stranded, we're gonna talk about here in a little bit when we talk about coding for proteins, is because it creates a protein from the double strand. So the double strand then attaches to an RNA, and we'll show that here. And that RNA only needs to be single-stranded because when it replicates, you've got those double-stranded um, DNA. RNA is also found in the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus, while DNA is not, okay? So the nucleus, remember, is kind of like that home base. It's that big kind of purple sphere. It's not really purple in your body. I guess it could be. If you want a purple nucleus, you can have one. Um, but the RNA leaves the nucleus to go make some proteins, whereas the DNA doesn't leave the nucleus. It doesn't leave the mitochondria. It's in the organelle that it's in. Okay. So here's a little bit of review about what proteins are. Proteins are macromolecules. Their building blocks, or essentially their subunits, are called amino acids, okay? Uh, so like maybe you've heard of like amino acids being in like a protein or in a drink or things like that, because amino acids are good for you, right? They help with proteins. Having proteins in your body helps with muscle recovery and energy and fighting off infections, keeping you healthy, things like that. So that's kind of a little bit like if you've ever seen like an amino energy drink, it probably has amino acids in it. The sequence of amino acids is determined to make the shape of the protein. So we've got essentially a code of DNA, like this one. I'm gonna erase my, uh, my folder. Okay, so we've got this code of DNA right here. And we know that DNA has a complementary pair. So you maybe had to do this in high school. I had to do it in high school. We had to write all the pairs out. We don't have to do that in this class. Okay, so this is DNA. Okay, it then is coded into RNA, which is going to make, make me go backwards here. Let's see. Oh, no T's, what am I doing? U, U, A, A, C, yeah, this is RNA. All right, and from this RNA, we wanna make proteins. We wanna make proteins, they're over here. Don't get hung up on the letters so much, right? Just the process. And from this code, these, when there's three in a row like this, they code for a certain amino acid. And I think it's gonna come up here in a couple of slides. There's a table in your book, all right? And it'll say, if C is in the first position, C is in the second position, and U is in the last position, this codes for a certain amino acid. And I don't wanna mess these up, because I'm gonna, uh, they have certain names. There we go. What that? Uh oh. No. I bumped something. What did I do here? No, that's good. That's good. That's good. Did it work? I don't know. Okay. So this lovely table, I never had to memorize it, so neither do you, okay? What you have to do is go through the left column, then the top row, then the right column. So the first base, here we've got U. So then I go to that purplish, bluish color, it's U. So now I know I'm gonna be in that top fourth of the table. Then the second position is C. So then I go to the kind of reddish pink color and then my third position is also a C. So then I go to the right side. So U, C, C. C. Searing, perfect, yes. Which if you like puzzles or like Sudoku puzzles, this is, this is the game for you right here. All right, Searing. Let's do it again for this one. C, C, U. C, C, U, proline. A, A, C, A, A, C, 
I'm gonna have a great time writing that one. S or Somebody's moving a card or something. Okay, so these are called amino acids. And they are coded because of the pattern that we have here. Okay, so these are amino acids, which are the building block of proteins. All right, so we'll go back a couple of slides. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. So the amino acids are the subunits. That sequence of amino acids is what determines the shape of the protein. Okay, all proteins have different shapes. All right, and the shape helps with its function because it can fit into certain things. It fits into a certain activation site that codes for this certain thing. So the shape of the protein is pretty important. They are synthesized by ribosomes. So ribosomes make proteins. Proteins are important for diverse functions in the body, including hormones, enzymes, and transport. So that fight or flight you have when you have that adrenaline rush, maybe you're, at a, you're playing a video game or you're at a sporting event or you're watching a game show on TV, whatever that is, you got this adrenaline rush, you're really excited about it. Your body's reacting to that in hormones and it's giving you those certain feelings. Those are created by proteins. So they can denature, causing a loss of function. And I've given this example before, when you, have, you wanna make a scrambled egg. Sorry if you're vegan, but if you wanna make a scrambled egg, right, you've got a liquid egg, you crack it into the pan. I usually add a little bit of fair life milk. I like fair life, okay. And then you whisk it together, turn on my heat, right? I should have already turned on my heat though, cooking lesson, right? You wanna pour it into a hot pan. But anyways, I just turned on my heat and now what's it gonna to do to my eggs? They're gonna be liquid or solid at the end of this. They're gonna be solid, right? So what's happening there is I'm denaturing the proteins by adding some heat and I'm changing the shape, which is also changing their function. Personally, I'm not gonna eat a raw egg, but to each their own. So that's changing the function for me anyways. All right, so we have two steps to gene expression. What is gene expression? It's essentially like, well, when you express yourself, right, maybe you ex express yourself through writing or dance or sports or whatever that is, music, insert hobby here, right? When you express yourself, you're showing something maybe, or you're feeling something, that's what genes are doing, kind of, right? So when a gene expresses itself, like say when you're an infant child, there needs to be a gene expression that's going on that's for growth and development. Now it's not gonna happen overnight, right? It's going to happen over some time, but the correct genes are there. And then at a certain time in your life, those genes turn off, just like a light switch, right? When you walk into a room, you turn the light switch on, you have some light, the light is showing. When we walk out of the room today, we'll turn the lights off. It's not showing. So that's what gene expression is. Some genes are expressed your whole life. Some genes turn on later in life. There's a whole thing, and you know what? I don't know all the specifics to every single gene, and there isn't a scientist out there that does, but essentially we do know that the steps in order to get there are through transcription and translation. Transcription is where the DNA is read to make mRNA in the nucleus. I think of transcription like when you transcribe something, like think about somebody who's sitting there taking notes or the person in the courtroom that does it all abbreviated. I think that's really cool when they're like, you know what I mean? That's somebody transcribing something. Anybody type that fast? It's okay to admit it. So you can type hackers. What's that? 90s hackers. 90s hackers. Okay. So we've got some transcription going on. They're essentially telling the mRNA what to do. So this is the, this is, you know, you could also think of it like when you're shipping a package or you buy something online, okay? I bought a new vacuum on Amazon. We're gonna see if I like it or not. But, so I went on amazon.com and I typed it in. I was like, Amazon, I want a vacuum for my hardwood floor. I wanna be able to vacuum all the rocks and the sand that comes in, okay. So I've got this, I type it into my computer. That's me telling the computer what to do. That's transcription. 
mRNA is in like the Amazon company or the UPS person that's going to bring it to my door. Okay. Translation, the second step is essentially what you may think it is. Like when somebody is translating, they're maybe helping you kind of understand another language. Can anybody speak another language in this class? Look at that. We're so cool. You guys are really awesome. Okay. So if somebody is translating, they're kind of going between and talking about two different languages. That's what's essentially going on right here. So the mRNA is red and we need to figure out what the mRNA says so that we can make a protein. That's what translation is. So transcription is like transcribing. Translation is like when you translate something. So those are the two steps to figure out how we show gene expression. This is because we're trying to create some proteins right now. All right, we've seen this slide before. Okay, so the amino acid chain or the pattern of amino acids comes from this table here. Okay, it's made of four kinds of bases, U, C's, A's, and G's, and these bases act as a code or yeah, like a 90s hacker's code for amino acids that are used in translation. So the step where I was like going through each letter and determining what amino acid was, that was me translating for you guys, right? Because I could speak in this language. We wanted to see it in this language, okay? Every three bases of mRNA is called a codon. A typical codon transfers a particular amino acid in translation. Another couple of cool ones, you can kind of see um, a couple here on the right that are in orangish red color. Uh, they're not really orangey red on your slide. Oh yeah, they are. Okay, so these are called stop codons. There, and this one down here, where'd it go? It's called a start codon. And those are special ones because it's essentially like a stop sign or a red or a green light when you're driving. That's essentially what these are, but with coding for DNA. So if we're going along and then all of a sudden I see a UGA, our body or our DNA can recognize that as a stop codon. Stop. And that's when they know it's the end of that sequence or else it kind of makes sense that we need that, right? Or else we just have this really long line of proteins and DNA that never ended, right? We got to know when it's a new function or a new trait or a new hormone or things like that. So let's break these steps down a little bit more. So transcription, mRNA is made from a DNA template. So essentially we want mRNA to be somewhere in here. This is me sitting at my computer. I didn't want to have to go to the store to buy the vacuum because I don't have time for that, right? And it's safer, right? I'm safer, I'm not going to the store. Online shopping, okay. So then you have the mRNA, which is either the company that you bought it from, your computer, whatever makes sense to you. But it's understanding what the DNA is telling them so that we can keep moving on. This mRNA is processed before leaving the nucleus. So you can also think about Sorry, we're gonna get rid of our grizzly bear here too. Okay, now we're inside the nucleus. Nucleus, okay. The mRNA moves to the ribosomes to be read. So it travels and it moves. And these are some ribosomes and it's telling these ribosomes, hey, Alex ordered a vacuum. So processing of mRNA after transcription, so it, the modifications of mRNA, one end of the RNA is capped, and what I like to think of is like a top hat. Does that look like a top hat to you guys? You know, like a top hat? Okay, cool. So it's just saying one end is capped, and it's just saying this is where we're going to start. Think of it like the hat on your head is kind of the top of your head. Um, introns are removed. We don't talk a lot about introns in this class, but essentially all the unnecessary stuff is kind of taken out and a poly A tail is added. So at the end, we've got a bunch of A's, a poly A tail, just a bunch of A's. 
that's just informing us that's like, hey, we're at the end here. Okay. All right, so this is an, a better description of what I'm trying to draw right here. This is DNA. All right, it coded for something. We made some mRNA right here. So the mRNA has what the DNA said. Okay, these are called exons and introns. And essentially the lighter purple color is removed. This is the cap and this is the poly A tail. Okay, so this is the top hat that I drew up there and this is the tail. It's essentially telling us where do we start, where do we stop. Okay, you can think of it like if you're gonna make somebody a bracelet, you know, you measure their hand and then you, or their wrist and then you maybe tie a knot on one end and you put some beads on the string and then you tie a knot on the other end. The two knots are essentially what's going on right here because we only want it to be a certain size. Okay, this is called spliceosome. It's an enzyme that takes out those introns because what we want our mRNA to say at the end is just this. All right, so this is then like taking off my shipping because I've got some Amazon front, right? I don't want to pay for that shipping. That's unnecessary. This is what I want. Okay. So this mRNA, it talked to the DNA and it said, okay, this is what we got. Now I'm going to leave the nucleus so that I can go to these ribosomes and tell them what we're going to code for so that we can make some proteins. First is the step is initiation. Second is elongation and third is termination which the words kind of help make sense. When you initiate something, you start something, right? When you elongation, the word long in there, just think of making something long, like making the bracelet, and then termination, like the terminator, right? I am the terminator. Okay. Initiation is when the mRNA binds to the small ribosomal subunit. Remember, that's the hamburger bun. And it causes the two ribosomal subunits to associate. So the mRNA makes the hamburger bun or the black bean gluten-free burger bun. Elongation is then the polypeptide chain. So now we're gonna make, use that as a machine to make our long bracelet. The tRNA picks up an amino acid and the anticodon is complementary to the codon. tRNA anticodon binds to the codon, drops off the amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. And then all of a sudden we're gonna terminate it. We're gonna hit a stop codon and it causes the ribosome to fall off the mRNA. And what happens next is kind of visualized here. So first we have initiation in green, elongation in yellow, and C, termination. So remember our main goal is to have this cool little bracelet thing going on right here. And our hamburger bun is detached, okay? So we go through initiation. This mRNA makes these two pieces come together. The two pieces are essentially the machine that's going to make our chain. We go through all these steps between the different types of rRNA and the RNA and tRNA. We then come out with um, the release factor hydrolyzes the bond between the last tRNA and the P site and the polypeptide releasing them. So we all end up with a polypeptide chain. Here's another visualization of where this is happening in the cell. So on the top left there, that's our, nucle or our nucleus. It's purple in this picture, kind of looks like a big planet, okay? The blue in there is the DNA. We then go outside of the nucleus to do this next step of translation. So transcription happens in the nucleus, translation happens in the cytoplasm, and they walk through those steps there. So now that we know how we start to express genes, so we started with the DNA, we made some protein now, we made a polypeptide chain, that protein has a specific function. How do we regulate gene expression? How does our body know when to turn a gene on and when to turn it off, okay? Or how do we regulate the different steps of transcription and translation? So I think of these as like checkpoints at the airport, right? First you go into the airport, you need to check your bag, right? So that's the first thing, or maybe even on the, in the car on the way there, you checked into your flight, okay? 
that's that pre-transcriptional control. This is happening in the nucleus. Chromatin, which is an association of protein and DNA density and the DNA accessibility, this is essentially controlling before anything starts. So like I said, I check into my flight on my phone before I got there, okay? Transcriptional control, this happens in the nucleus. So this is maybe when you go to check your bag, right? You're standing there in line. You gotta check this bag. I hope it's under 50 pounds. It's always a struggle for me. Post-transcriptional control. So after transcription, now I've checked my bag and I'm gonna head towards security, right? This is the, when the mRNA is processing. Translational control, this is when I'm going through security. Gotta take my shoes off, gotta put my laptop in the bag or in the box, take it out of the bag, things like that. And then post-translational control, this is when I may be sitting at my gate and they have to scan your ticket again before you get onto the flight. Okay, these are just different ways that we regulate gene expression. Okay, you can see those in that picture there. I wouldn't worry about the visualization as much and just knowing that there's different ways to regulate gene expression. DNA technology. Okay, we're thankful for DNA technology for a couple of different reasons. Um, what we can use DNA technology for is like gene cloning through recombinant DNA. So I would clone genetics or genes in my lab for my thesis, but it's not like you think I'm like creating a sheep. Like I'm not going to clone a sheep. I'm not that, I'm not that good, right? If I was, I probably would not be here. But so I'm not cloning a, an organism. We're essentially creating another copy of DNA. You can use this cloning to do also something called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So when I would do my research, I would use polymerase chain reaction. It's essentially like a copy machine to make a whole bunch of copies of this specific section of that DNA. And by making a lot of copies of it, I'm able to look at it and see it because it's so small. DNA fingerprinting is then comparing that piece of DNA to something that is known that you know, or maybe a crime scene where you have to compare some suspects to you know, the DNA from the crime scene that was collected because everybody's DNA is different. That's why it's called DNA fingerprinting. You all have a different fingerprint than each other. Biotechnology products from bacteria, plants, and animals we use for other things. So let's talk about some of these terms. One of them is called genetic engineering. Okay, if you think of what an engineer does, maybe an engineer at John Deere or an engineer who builds airplanes or whatever, um, so genetic engineering is altering DNA in, the bacteria, in a bacteria, a virus, or plants and animal cells through recombinant DNA technology. So we can change DNA in, say, like E. coli, a bacteria, in order to maybe clone so more DNA can grow and divide. Recombinant DNA, it contains DNA from two or more different sources. So um, this is a little bit of upper level thinking, but I think you guys got it here. So we we're going to look at E. coli, and let's say that this E. coli DNA looks like this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to insert some of my my subjects DNA. So my master's thesis was on pocket gopher lice. Don't worry about the subjects. But what I would do is I take the DNA and put it into something like E. coli. E. coli grows and divides really fast. So now I've got two E. coli's with this little specific part that I put in there and it's able to grow and divide and so I can use that um, for essentially the research that I was doing. I was trying to define some DNA. Transgenetic organisms have a foreign gene inserted into them. So that's kind of like what I was talking about here. And then biotechnology is using a natural biological system to create a product or achieve an end desired by humans, okay? DNA sequencing, this is pretty interesting. This allows us to know the pattern of letters, okay? So this is the order of nucleotides in the DNA sequence is determined. This started to happen in the 1970s, which isn't too long ago. I mean, none of us were, 
I don't think any of us were alive in 1970. Speak up if, I mean, you guys look great. Um, <laughs> um, performed manually using dye terminator substances. So the dyes would react with the different letters. So then there was a pattern of dye or color. And when there was a certain color, it meant a certain letter. And so we were able to tell what's the sequence or what's the order of the letters of that DNA. It's now performed using dyes attached to nucleotides with a laser and a computerized machine to determine a sequence. It goes really fast. So um, you put in the certain dyes that react with the nucleotides and when the dyes come across, the laser reads it and the laser is corresponding with a computer and it just pops up on my computer, computer screen and it goes A, C, G, T, 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 A, G, G, T, T because of the liquid that I put into the machine, which is pretty cool that it can determine that. So there's a me, no, I'm just kidding, it's not me, sitting in a lab here um, looking at a DNA sequence machine. So this is essentially where they put the DNA in, like the liquid, where the dyes are reacting with the laser. And this is essentially the code that comes out. And you can see on here a graph, and it's just saying the probability in which it actually is a D at this location. And as you can see, all these peaks are pretty high. That's saying that at this location, we're pretty, we're pretty sure that it's a G. Now, sometimes you get something that messes up, and I wouldn't say that that's a mess up by any means, but those peaks are smaller than this peak. This is just saying it's a lower probability that that's a G and a C at, or G and a T at that location. So. That's just a little bit about how that DNA sequencer works. This PCR that I talked about before, polymerase chain reaction, it's used to clone small pieces of DNA and it's important for amplifying DNA for analysis such as DNA fingerprinting. So I think about it as like a piece of paper that you put into a copy machine, excuse me, copy machine. If we needed, you know, back in the day when we used to take exams in person, You'd go to the copy machine, you'd say, here's my exam. I'd like 25 copies of this exam. And you stick the paper in there and it shoots out 25 copies. So it went from maybe a slim, uh, like a slim piece of paper to now a stack of papers like this big. Now do that with DNA, but like millions of times. Okay, so DNA is so small, but if we were to copy a specific part of that DNA over and over and over, it's essentially how many pieces of paper, you know, if I stacked up a million pieces of paper on top of each other, I could probably see it from across campus, right? That's essentially what we want to do here. That's what polymerase chain reaction. It uses a polymerase, which is an enzyme, and a reaction of heating and cooling and heating and cooling to replicate the DNA that you're looking at and make a really big copy of it so that we can see it. It's the same copy over and over and over. Okay, this is a better explanation of that. So here you have the DNA segment that you want to amplify. Okay, the DNA is denatured. So we add heat, change the shape of the function, we separate right here. The DNA is cooled to lower the temperature to allow it annealing of the primers. So then we add some of these things called primers. If you've ever painted a wall or done makeup before, you always put a primer on first, right? It's going to help uh, with the smoothness, but in this case, it's just gonna kind of tell us that like, hey, I wanna look from here to here. So I'm gonna put some primers out here so I know that I'm only gonna be looking at the stuff in the middle. Then we add on some TAC DNA polymerase, which is essentially going to allow us to continue to replicate and make lots of copies. So now these two copies each make two copies, and then these two copies each make two copies, and we just kind of grow and multiply in that sense that it exponentially grows to make a lot of copies of that specific point of DNA. Okay, then we have this thing called DNA fingerprinting. So now that we've got a bunch of copies of DNA, I wanna be able to look at it. So what we do is then I would put some DNA in these little wells, in these little holes right here, okay? Um, another fun fact is that DNA is negatively charged. Okay, so it has a negative charge. Um, and what we do here is this one's called a marker. So it's essentially like I'm putting a ruler in here that I know has certain markers. Like I would know that this is 100 base pairs. I would know that this has 200 base pairs. Okay, so what am I talking about with base pairs? 
Um, so BP stands for base pairs. And the base pairs are the, the letters, base, nucleotide base pairs. So if I have more, so let's say that, that goes on for 100. This one's going to go on for 200. This one, next one's going to go on for 300. When something has more base pairs, I think of it like a race, right? So we've got, I don't know, how much do you guys think you think both ways? He weighs like 200 pounds, maybe. Seems like a muscular guy. You guys know he's saying bolt weighs like muscular maybe. Seems like I'll do that. Okay. So he's saying bolt. He's 180 pounds. Okay. What's a really good uh who's a really big lineman in the NFL? Thinking like retired but then she was born. Oh, this was like 350. Yeah. You like 350? Okay. Now, this is a very uh, exaggerated, but who's going to win this race? The same bolt or Vince? Vince. Yeah. Who do you think is going to win? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you same bolt, right? For obvious reasons. But when it comes down to this, essentially, the same bolt's going to get further in a certain amount of time than this one. Okay. So, think of it like a foot race. But also, it's going to take a little bit. So our DNA is inserted up here. And it's going to travel this way because I'm going to turn on some electricity. It's going to have a positive charge over here. So that negative DNA is just kind of like crawling across. You saying both going to just sprint across, obviously. Right? And Vince, our football player, I'm sure he was very athletic. I'm sure he would, you know, give him a run for his money. But let's just, in this example, let's just say that it, he lost the race, okay? So here's the same bolt at the end of it, right? He's just lengths and bounds ahead of us. So as our DNA separates, we'll know that in that certain location that we amplified, that it's going to end up somewhere on this chart because I turned on the electricity, the DNA moved across because it's negatively charged and I added some positive charge. It's like you put two ends of a magnet that are opposites. They go together pretty quickly, right? And then it separates. So here, this is called DNA fingerprinting. We've got a crime scene, okay? This marker is just telling us, kind of like a ruler, we know what these are gonna come out at and what they mean. At the crime scene, we found some DNA. So we put it into a polymerase chain reaction. We made a lot of copies of that crime scene DNA and we put it in there. And we had two suspects. We didn't know which suspect did it, but we'll know because the suspect's DNA would match with the one that was at the crime scene. And do you guys know who did it, A or B? B, yeah, because B looks like the crime scene. Do you see how A only has one band, even though they all have the same band here, it doesn't have that second band like the other one. So now through DNA fingerprinting and identifying, we were able to look at a small piece of DNA that we made a bunch of copies of and we compared it on this chart in order to see who did it in the crime scene. You guys all are now criminology majors. Congratulations. Gene cloning, it's a little different than what you think it is. While there are some things when people are like, yes, we're gonna clone sheep. It's like a whole other thing, right? We're not worried about that right now. Gene cloning just is like what polymerase chain reaction is doing. It's making lots and lots of copies. And sometimes we can do that through recombinant DNA. And it's when a DNA is from two or more different sources that allows the genes to be cloned. It's like me putting my DNA into some E. coli because I know that E. coli is going to grow and divide a lot faster. Okay. E. coli is a bacteria and it could be used to clone the DNA or the, the gene for human insulin. Okay. Not all individuals are able to create insulin in the same uh, manner as other people. So it's good that we can clone the human insulin gene to make some more insulin for the people who can't produce insulin as, or at a rate as the same as other people. Um, the restriction enzyme is used to cut the vector, the plasmid. Anybody seen uh, Despicable Me? What's the villain's name? Vector. Oh, well, Groot, 
was a villain at one point, wasn't he? It's a good answer. But yeah, vector. I always think of that. So vector cuts out. So we use the um, restriction enzyme is used to cut the vector plasmid and the human DNA with the insulin gene. The DNA ligase seals together the insulin gene and the plasmid and the bacterial cells take up the plasmid. The gene is copied and produced can be made. So now we're making a bunch of more insulin because we can put it into this bacteria that's going to grow and divide that gene a lot for us which would then allow us to produce more insulin. Here's a visualization of that. So you have a human cell on the left. At the top, we know it's an animal cell by its color and its shape. Okay, we take some of the DNA that we're interested in, like the gene that codes for insulin. We take that specific little gene out and we put it into a plasmid vector. Every time I say vector, now I'm thinking of, I am vector. Um, what we guys have to watch this weekend for your homework, right? Despicable me. Okay, so, and then we put it into this bacteria. Okay, so this circle, then it becomes recombinant DNA, which is kind of what I drew up here. It wasn't too bad of a drawing, right? The green with the red, it looks just kind of like that. Okay, then the host cell takes up the recombinant plasmid and it grows and divides as fast as bacteria does. Think about how fast bacteria grows and divides compared to you. A lot faster. Okay, so here are some important things that we use biotechnology products for. We just gave the example of insulin. Okay, so when individuals can't produce insulin, we create insulin for them and give it to them. Now there's other different types of diabetes and some of the types of diabetes mean that you can't produce insulin. Some of them mean that your body doesn't receive insulin very well, and that's a different aspect. And then there's other types that are um, more about your lifestyle choices. Um, we can use it for the human growth hormone, HGH. Clotting factor, okay? A lot of us have normal clotting factors, but some people do not, and that's okay. But what we do is we use these biotechnology products to create more of those clotting factors for people who can't clot their blood as well. Tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, it's used for cancer. Hepatitis B vaccine, we used for biotechnology products. Um, naturally occurring oil degenerating bacteria can be made for more effective through gene engineering. So all of these like things that we maybe don't really realize that happens, happen in the world of medicine are because of a lot of these biotechnology products. One of them being transgenetic organisms. So if you didn't know, there's a crisis in our world that not everybody eats as well as we get to eat in the Mensa, right? That's a problem. Our world is overpopulated. Our food is not meeting up to that, okay? So how do scientists kind of adapt to that? Well, we can make a bigger fish so that that one fish could maybe feed somebody for two meals instead of just one from the small fish or maybe something that you would need two or three fish for to supplement a meal, whatever. Insert the example there. Or maybe there's a certain type of rice that will endure drought and storm. So even though there's a big tsunami that comes through a certain country that is producing rice that helps feed the world, although that storm came through, we can our rice is going to prevail because it has certain qualities that if there's flooding or if there's drought, it can adapt to those things. These are called transgenetic organisms. These are things that scientists kind of adapt for human benefit in order for us to kind of get the benefit that we want, being that most of the case it's to help feed the hungry or feed America, because we eat a lot of food around here. Um, also, have you ever, anybody seen the movie Crazy Rich Asians? It's a pretty good one. Favorite line of the movie is that they're starving kids in America. It's a good one that makes me laugh. Okay. Biotechnology products, transgenetic plants. Okay, so you can create a plant, like I was saying, that's resistant to herbicides or resistant to insects or resistant to frost, which around here, that'd be pretty great if we could get our farmers able to plant a week earlier because they're not having to fight the Iowa frost, 
right, the cool temperatures of Iowa because our plants are resistant to it, we could get maybe more out of our crops that way. Who knows? I'm not a pharmacist, farmer, almost a pharmacist. I'm not a farmer. I'm not a agriculturist, but I can tell you that through biotechnology, you can adapt the plant in its genetics on the inside to make it resistant to the things that you want it to be. Okay, you got an insect problem. These plants are resistant to that, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, a little bit more about genetically engineered plants. Um, some of the ones that are most commonly genetically engineered are corn, soybeans, cotton plants. These all are kind of genetically altered to benefit essentially humans, usually to prevail against something that would normally be destructive towards it. Um, in 2011, 94% of soybeans and 80% of the corn planted in the United States has been genetically engineered. All right, so then we've got another picture down here of an herbicide resistant soybean plant, and then also a, a pest resistant potato, potato plant here on the bottom, comparing it to a control, which would be a plant that was not um, resistant to the pest. And then the plant on the right, which is resistant to pests. So it's able to prevail, even though there was a pest problem. Here's a couple of other um, examples of other transgenetic plants that can be used when we are thinking about like rice and corn and cotton and sugar cane and sugar beets and canola and all of these things that we want to make sure that we're making enough of. Now, most people would think that it's just on plants, but also with animals, right? Uh, we've got a gene that is inserted into the egg that was fertilized when developed into a transgenetic animal. So we can produce cows that create more milk, right? If you've got 10 cows and they can produce a certain amount of milk and you can ser you know, sell it, serve it, whatever you're trying to do, or could we have those 10 cows that produce twice as much milk? Now I can sell one and keep one for my family. Thoughts? some business into this. Um, the larger animals such as fish, cows, pigs, rabbits, and sheep, um, mouse models. So we use mice a lot of the times for a lot of um, genetic studies. You better best believe that the COVID vaccine was probably tested on a mouse somewhere in a lab somewhere before it was given to any human. Obviously there's some ethics that go into that, but specifically mice are used because they have a similar genetic makeup to humans. And they also have a similar um, developmental stages to humans as well. Uh, and the last one there, I'm gonna butcher this name, xenotransplantation is when pigs can express human proteins on their organs and makes it easier to transplant them into humans. Fun fact there, okay. Um, this is how we can produce a transgenetic animal. So if we know that we're going to have a, a sheep or a calf, I think this is a sheep. Um, and we know, oh yeah, it's a goat. There we go. This goat. Thanks. So we have a goat and we put in the human growth hormone into the egg that is going to be fertilized to create a new goat. Now that human growth hormone is in the milk of the organism essentially and now we're able to develop that and produce more milk because we inserted that human growth hormone into the egg of the goat. All right so in 20 or 20, 2003, so when, what year were a lot of you born? 01. 01? 99. Okay. So we're getting there. I'm going to be teaching this class in like four years and somebody's not going to be alive in 2003. Um, I'm waiting for that time. But in 2003, the human genome was sequenced. So that wasn't too long ago, right? Essentially what happened was they took the DNA of a human and put it into that machine that I showed you that's able to kind of tell us the sequence or the pattern of those genes. That happened about 2003. The human genome consists of 3.4 million or billion bases, excuse me, and 23,000 genes. And we don't know what all of them do. Okay. 
There are polymorphisms or small regions of DNA that vary among individuals. Although we are all humans and we're all different and we look different, we talk different, we have different experiences, a lot of our DNA is very similar. And I think, is there a chart in this? No, it might be in your book. There's a chart that I'm thinking of that says that we have, I think, only 3% different genetics than like a cow. Like all of our DNA is so much similar to a cow and then there's like 3% that makes us who we are as humans. We have an upright stance and thumbs and I can communicate and have cognitive behaviors. All right, 3% different than a cow. So what that's saying is there are only little squirts and little parts of the DNA that vary among individuals that make us different. So there's only a small portion that actually is different. The genome size is not correlated with the number of genes or complexity of the organism. Just because we are complex organisms does not mean that we have more genes or more DNA than another individual. So there may be, I, I have to think of a specific example. We can use a cow, for example. A cow may have another thousand genes than us. What if they had 24,000 genes? Does that mean that the cow is a more complex organism than a human? Not necessarily. Depends how you define that, right? Genome size is not correlated with the number. Oh, I just said that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's right. Okay, what is the next step in the human genome project? So we know that there's 23,000 genes and we know that genes make up less than 2% of the entire human genome, um, but it allows us to understand how species have evolved, how we evolved into the people that we are today from our ancestors, how have we developed differently than our primates, our fellow primates who have very similar genetics to us um, comparing genomes can help us identify base sequences that cause human illness. So maybe there's a certain genetic disease that we can identify because we know the sequence of a human genome and we can see the difference between like a person who does not have the disease and a person who does have the disease and we can say they have these three base pairs different. If we could alter those three base pairs, we could cure their genetic disease. Who knows? Um, it also comes with our understanding of gene regulation. So how are genes regulated? This is just an example to show you how related we are to primates um, and how our genetics kind of evolved from there. So you can see that we have a mouth um, that has two lips, which is similar to the primate on the top picture. Our ears have a similar shape as well as our nose. Okay, so we're not too far off from the organisms in which we evolved from. And it wasn't just over one uh, generation, yeah. Um, I wanted to tell something like with comparing the genetics of the bonobo monkeys. It was really cool because I'm sure 98% of our genetics are human. Oh, yes. So it's really cool. Yes. And are those the ones that have like a lot of um, communication yes. skills too, right? Those types of monkeys, they can communicate a lot of um, communication skills too, right? Those types of monkeys, they can communicate, like they can show them like a picture and they can communicate. I've seen those before. Yes, yeah, so like you said, 98% of similar genetics to this, what was it called? Bonobo monkeys. Bonobo monkeys. Yes, exactly. That's a kind of what we're talking about right here is you can see that we have evolved probably, or the, the theory is that we evolved from um, similar primates and that the genetics is very similar. To, like you said, there's only 2% difference between us and them. So what's happening now? Proteomics. This is the study of proteins. And essentially, we said we have 23,000 genes. We don't know what all of them do, but guess what? There's like 46,000 proteins that code for those genes that we also don't know what they do. We know they exist, um, but these protein concentrations differ greatly between the cells. Why do proteins locations and concentrations interactions differ from minute to minute? We're creating a lot of proteins in the beginning of the day and we're not at the end of the day. Why is that? I don't know. That's just an example. Understanding proteins may lead to discovery of better drugs. If we could discover a protein that helps us, that is helping us fight off an infection, but maybe we could create more of that protein and give it to somebody who can't, understanding proteins could really um, help us there. Bioinformatics. This is the application of computer technologies to study genome. 
There's something called gene therapy, and this is the insertion of genetic material into human cells to treat a disorder. Obviously, there's some ethics, there's some beliefs here. We're just stating what it's called and what the facts are. Um, so an ex vivo therapy and in vivo therapy, they're different. And the name kind of tells us a little bit of the story. So ex vivo therapy are cells that are removed from the body for treatment and then reintroduced back into the body. And in vivo therapy is when the vector is introduced directly into the body, most likely created in a lab. The gene therapy has been most successful in treating cancer. So if we could remove some bone marrow stem cells, so our stem cells are created in our bone marrow um, and all of our major compact bone, we then use the retrovirus to bring the normal gene into the bone marrow and the stem cells. The viral recombinant DNA car carries the normal gene to the genome and then we put it back, the genetically modified, uh, we put it back into the cells of the patient to, you know, essentially maybe introduce some sort of, um, like it says, the different DNA or like the viral recombinant DNA that carries the normal gene into the genome. So we're altering the DNA to maybe treat cancer or treat a dis genetic disease, okay? There's a lot of new research out about this. This is not like something that's been around for a long, long time, but something that 